VIU Online presents GEC 101 English Composition, Week 6 Theoretical Lecture, Writing for Diverse Multilingual Audiences. This lecture is presented by Dr. Laura Hills, Professor of English at Virginia International University. Our reading this week will be helpful for students who are non-native speakers and writers of English. In this lecture, we will also consider the special challenges any writer faces when writing for a multilingual audience. And that is the way we are writing more and more today. The internet has made the world a smaller place. And we are communicating with people all over the world and even in our own nation who come to English not as a native speaker and so we may need to do some adjustments in our writing when we know we're writing for a multilingual audience. Who is your reader? Well the truth is in many cases you may not know and so if you don't know for certain that you're writing for a specific reader you need to assume that that reader may be from a different culture and may in fact be approaching English as a non-native speaker. We must avoid cultural references specific to our own culture, therefore, when writing for a multilingual, multicultural audience. And we all have a national culture. No matter what nation is our home, there are certain things that people in our nation know that others from the outside may not know. And I'm going to give you some examples that come from American culture now. The first is the term Civil War. The United States has had one Civil War. It occurred in the middle of the 1800s. So if I am in the United States and I just mention the Civil War, Americans will assume I'm talking about that war. But of course, there are civil wars that occur in other places in the world and in other times. So I must be careful when writing for people in other nations who may not know that if I simply say the Civil War to an American, I'm speaking of that war. Here's a second example. We have a very peculiar holiday in the United States on February 2nd called Groundhog's Day. A groundhog is a rodent who hibernates in the winter. And we believe that if the groundhog emerges from his sleep on February 2nd and sees his own shadow, that means he's able to, we're able to predict how much longer we will have winter. In fact, this is not only specific to the United States, but it has a regional meaning as we do not have snow in all parts of the United States. So using a term such as Groundhog's Day would have no meaning if you don't know this holiday, if you're from outside of the national culture. Third example. Every year in November we have a holiday we call Thanksgiving, and right at the beginning of the table, right at the corner, you see a dish with a red berry concoction. That is cranberry sauce. That is a particular dish served as a, a side to turkey at Thanksgiving, though people eat it at other times of the year. That's when Americans most likely eat it. I can tell you, having taught at Virginia International University, that I have shared cranberry sauce with students who come from other countries who find it rather remarkable that we eat it at all, let alone as a side dish to turkey that is roasted. And so again, not being in the culture, you might not know what I'm speaking of if I use the term cranberry sauce. Also in the United States, we have regions of our country. We do have 50 states here, but we also have regions. And I know working with students from other countries, they may not recognize a term such as New England. New England refers to a composition of six states in the American Northeast. It's Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. We call that region New England. Again, when writing for an audience of people in other lands, they probably will not know that term, and so I should not use it without defining it. 
I also know working with students from all around the world that football means one thing in the United States. This is a picture of American football. But in other countries, the term football is a sport that Americans refer to as soccer. This has to be clarified in your writing for a multilingual, multicultural audience from outside the United States. And I also have discovered working with students who have traveled to the United States to study with us face to face at Virginia International University that they are baffled when they go to an American supermarket for the first time to try to buy milk because we have many kinds of milk products that are not explained but you have to know what they mean and here is one of them it's called half and half this is a product that is essentially half milk half cream but there are other terms like two percent one percent skim and what do these mean Again, if you're from outside of this nation, chances are you may not be familiar with those terms. So as a writer, writing for people who are new to this nation or who do not have familiarity with my country, it's up to me to remember that they may not know these many things. And the truth is every writer in every nation has the same kinds of national specific knowledge. I'm sure I would not know many things that would stem from other cultures outside of the United States. So if you were writing for me, you'd have to explain them as well. We also have to assume that people may be from outside of our own religious culture and be careful in our writing not to make assumptions because our reader in a diverse situation could be from any number of religions and may not be familiar with ours. Idioms and expressions can be very challenging for non-native speakers of English. And I'm going to give you some examples of ones. They're not intuitive. So you'd have to know what they mean. If someone tells you, I've been under the weather, it means they're sick. But if you're not familiar with that idiom, it's going to be very confusing to you. So when writing for non-native speakers of English, we would be best to avoid this kind of an idiom. If we say to someone, don't sweat it, we're saying, don't worry about it. Keep your shirt on means be patient. The person isn't literally trying to take a shirt off. It means just be patient. I know where the bodies are buried. There are no bodies we're speaking of here. It means you know the secrets. She had me in stitches has nothing to do with sewing. It's about laughter. To be in stitches means she made me laugh. If I say it's Greek to me, I'm not talking of Greece. It means I don't understand. It costs an arm and a leg. Not literally. It just means it's expensive. If something is a piece of cake, it's easy. You see how confusing it would be if you didn't know these expressions, these idioms. And there's no way to figure them out. You have to just know them. Every language has idioms, and if you're outside of them, then you don't know what they mean, and you can be lost. When writing for multilingual audiences who may not be familiar with, familiar with American culture, it's important to avoid expressions such as these that are going to be confusing. Another example, he has a nest egg. It means savings, money in the bank. It has nothing to do with eggs. And this is my favorite one because it's a real one to me. If you, um, I remember there was a, a young woman who was trying to clean something and a neighbor said, you have to give it some elbow grease. So she went to a store to try to buy a product called elbow grease only to discover it does not exist. When we say give it some elbow grease, it means work harder at it. Put some muscle into it and clean that way. Sometimes your audience is diverse because it is a mix of technicians, non-specialists, and experts. So they come to your writing with different levels of knowledge. That's very challenging as a writer. You may have people of everywhere from a novice to an expert reading what you have to say. 
So one thing you can do is state which audience you are addressing in the heading of each section. That's one way to organize writing when you know you're writing for a diverse audience given that they have different levels of knowledge, sort of a beginner level and a more advanced level. You can create modules that allow your reader to skip sections if they are more expert. You can include navigational aids such as a table of contents, a site map, a list of figures and tables. That would be helpful. And then also, I do this myself, you can create appendices. But here's a good example. Um, I published a book based upon a large research project that I did for an academic audience. Nonetheless, within that academic audience, I'd have people very well versed in the methodology I used, which was qualitative research and a case study specifically. And I'd have readers who probably would not be as familiar. I had a great deal I wanted to explain about the rationale for my method. So what I did is I put that in an appendix in the back. That way it was there for those who wanted it. But if you already knew a great deal about qualitative research, there'd be no reason to read it. It wouldn't be put into the middle, the body of my book, taking you away from what you wanted to know. So when writing for diverse people who have different knowledge, think in terms of separating out what a novice would need from an expert so you can have different pathways for people to choose. Use examples. This will help the novice apply the new information in a real-world setting and allow advanced users to confirm their knowledge. Examples are wonderful and work well for everyone. It's a great bridge when you have novice to expert readers. And also include graphics because everybody can appreciate those. Finally, for diverse audiences, you want to keep your language simple. And by that, avoiding not only the idioms and the national and religious expressions that are particular to you, but say it simply with shorter sentences and simpler words. Frankly, that's going to make your writing better for every reader. This concludes the theoretical lecture for week six.